Okay, I think uh, we might get started. Um, we've got around 68 people here already and people joining every minute. So hello and welcome. Um, we've just been sitting and waiting for people to join, but I'm just going to kick off formally. Um, welcome everybody. Good evening, afternoon. Uh, I hope that you've had a nice day despite the rain. It's been raining here in Southampton. Um, welcome to our sanctuary at University of Southampton virtual roundtable and Q&A. Um, my name's Tess Altman. I am the organizer of this event today and also the chair of the roundtable. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow, uh, an ESRC postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Southampton. Uh, and my research is about humanitarianism uh, and solidarity for people seeking asylum in hostile policy climates. And I'm organizing uh, this roundtable today as part of my fellowship. We are so pleased, I'm so pleased to see how much interest there is uh, in Universities of Sanctuary from the turnout. We've had 145 people register and we've got 73 people with us and climbing at the moment. Um, so I'm just super excited to see uh, how many people are joining and also how diverse our audience is today. We have people joining us from the University of Southampton. Uh, we have people from universities across the UK, uh, many of which are already universities of sanctuary. So they'll have some excellent insights for us, I'm sure. Uh, we also have people from NGOs, libraries, uh, galleries, social services, and also people from universities in Europe. So it's a great diverse audience. Um, I'm sure that this diversity will really lead us to some really productive discussion uh, and information sharing today in the Q&A. Uh, also, for those who've not been able to join us live today, uh, the roundtable is being recorded and it will be publicly available um, after the event. Okay, so uh, just a few words of thanks that I want to give before kicking off the roundtable properly. Um, so I'd really like to thank the Economic and Social Research Council and also the South Coast Doctoral Training Partnership who have both provided support and made this possible for me to put this event on as part of my ESRC fellowship. I'd also like to give a really big thanks to our uh, six speakers today who uh, you can see listed here on the slide. So we have Nicola Walters from City of Sanctuary UK. We have Tony Kushner from University of Southampton, Mike Brown, whoop, I, I skipped over, I'm, I, I went M to M, sorry, Maria Ahmed from Student Action for Refugees, Southampton, Mike Brown from Clear Project, Esther Adelecki from the University of Winchester, Steve Leggett, the Councillor for Fremantle, and we have closing remarks by Dr. Terry Sanderson from University of Winchester. Um, we also have uh, um, I would also like to give thanks um, to uh, Professor David Owen from the University of Southampton and Dr. Ignacia Artiaga from the University of Cambridge, both of whom are going to be assisting me with uh, the Q&A today. And also to um, Joe Hazel and Dr. Alexander Hay from the University of Southampton who are assist assisting today with event coordination. Okay, so uh, also just before we kick off, a few housekeeping things to mention just about how uh, things will go today. Um, so just um, bear with me. I'm not very good with this whole PowerPoint situation. Aha, I did it. Okay, so I've gone to a slide now which should be showing you um, the order of events for the day and some other housekeep housekeeping things. Uh, so the structure today is that in the first hour, we'll have around an hour of presentations from our six speakers. They'll each speak for about five to 10 minutes. And then in the second hour, we'll move to an audience live Q&A uh, as well, which will then be followed by closing remarks from Terry Sanderson and then some conclusion by me and some uh, thoughts on next steps. So um, you'll notice as you've entered um, that uh, your cameras and your mics have been switched off automatically. This is just to ensure that there are no accidental noise interruptions and um, our speakers uh, have their um, have their uh, cameras on so you can see their lovely faces and and we'll be you should be able to see us all in the Q and A. Um, but uh, even though your mics and cameras are switched off, there's a chat box there which is to be used for saying hi, um, making any comments, uh, or asking any questions. Um, and the other way in which you can participate throughout the event is on Twitter. If you'd like to tweet any comments or thoughts throughout the roundtable, please feel free to do so uh, with the hashtag 
hashtag Sanctuary Uni Soton. Um, and then there's also going to be questions for the live Q&A and they follow a little bit of a different process. So I'll just take a minute to explain that. So comments, uh, any comments are fine, but if you have a particular question for the live Q&A, please type this in uh, using the format on the slide here, just so we can differentiate it from the general comments. And that is to type the word question in caps, who it's directed to, uh, so a specific speaker or the panel as a whole, and then your question. Uh, and then David Owen and Ignacia Artiaga will be compiling those and they will be asking those questions on your behalf to the speakers, to the panel in the live Q&A. I hope that that all makes sense. All right, so with um, all of that out of the way and just a, a blanket apology if we don't get to your question, we'll do our best, but it depends on how many come through. Um, so with all that out of the way, uh, I just want to turn now to, to the purpose of our Sanctuary Roundtable today. So the purpose today is to have a really important conversation about the need for universities of Sanctuary. And this is particularly with a view to what needs to happen for the University of Southampton to become a University of Sanctuary. And I think this is a really important and timely, really crucial moment for us to be having this conversation. First is Refugee Week, uh, and there are many amazing events going on, which you can, uh, which you can go to online on refugeeweek.org.uk. Uh, um, and in Refugee Week, uh, we're doing a lot of uh, reflecting uh, about the situation for people seeking sanctuary and about forced migration. Um, and at the moment, there are more people seeking sanctuary from conflict and persecution than ever in the world. Also, uh, recent events in the current global climate have really given us all pause to reflect upon uh, what we can do better to address inequality and racism. Um, and I think for universities in particular, we have a role and responsibility to widen access and participation to education. And on that note, Universities of Sanctuary was founded in 2017 as a stream of City of Sanctuary UK. Uh, this means it's part of a wider UK sanctuary movement, which includes making public spaces such as cities, universities, schools, gardens, artistic venues, libraries, and more into places of welcome and hospitality for people seeking sanctuary. And to become a University of Sanctuary means being awarded an official sanctuary status by City of Sanctuary UK through demonstrating a real commitment to act as a space of welcome and support in, on a number of levels for people seeking sanctuary. And at the moment, there are currently 16 universities of sanctuary across the UK. Uh, and our neighbour, the University of Winchester, and as you'll notice, we have uh, a lot of Winchester contingent on our panel today. Our neighbour, the University of Winchester, is the first university in the south of England to be awarded this status. Um, but although uh, Southampton is a city of sanctuary, it's been a city of sanctuary um, for a couple of years, uh, we don't yet have a university of sanctuary in Southampton. And there's a growing movement of us within the university, uh, staff and students, and in the wider community as well, who would really like to see that change. Uh, and so this roundtable is in that spirit, bringing together perspectives from people across the community and sectors, from government, from NGOs, from academic, student and people seeking sanctuary perspectives themselves, to discuss why universities of sanctuary are important and also how Southampton can begin to make those steps towards getting a uh, university of sanctuary status. Um, so this is a conversation that's about the University of Southampton, but it's also a much bigger conversation that involves people from all sectors because it's about how we can foster solidarity with people seeking sanctuary. And I think it's gonna be a really useful conversation for other universities wanting to perhaps become universities of sanctuary as well. Uh, and for those in the audience who are already from universities of sanctuary, it's a great opportunity for us to learn from you and your experiences too, and to start building this movement. So uh, with that introduction to the purpose of the round table today, I'd like to hand over to our first speaker for the day, uh, Nicola Walters. 
Nicola is the Southwest Regional Coordinator for City of Sanctuary UK, a national charity aiming to build a culture of welcome for people seeking sanctuary within their local communities. One of her roles is to support the development of universities of sanctuary across the South and Southwest of England. Thank you, Nicola, I'll hand over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Tess. Um, my name is Nicola, and as Tess has already referenced, I'm the South and Southwest Regional Coordinator for City of Sanctuary UK. I also happen to live in Southampton, so it's really exciting for me to see the conversation about University of Sanctuary starting to happen here in my home city. Tess has offered me a slot today to talk to you for a short while about the University of Sanctuary movement and what it would mean for a University of Southampton to become a University of Sanctuary. City of Sanctuary holds the vision that the UK will be a welcoming place of safety for all, particularly those fleeing violence and persecution. In order to realise this vision, we support a group of groups across the UK which work to promote understanding, recognition and celebration of the ways in which people seeking sanctuary enrich our society. And Southampton is a city that's had a long history of welcoming and supporting refugees, and there are presently people from all stages of the asylum process living in our city. Many of these individuals, and where relevant, their children, would welcome the opportunity to attend the University of Southampton. So what is a University of Sanctuary? The University of Sanctuary stream is an initiative to recognise the good practice of universities that welcome people seeking sanctuary into their communities and seek to foster a culture of awareness and inclusivity. Since I started my role three years ago, I've been really pleased to see three universities in the South and Southwest region gain a University of Sanctuary award, and that's Bristol, Exeter and Winchester. A University of Sanctuary is a place where everyone feels safe, welcome and able to pursue their right to education. For many people seeking sanctuary, university can seem like an impossible goal, but equal access to higher education is enshrined in Article 26 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Access to education can be fundamental to a person's ability to integrate, gain meaningful employment at a suitable level and contribute to society. However, for many people who are forced to migrate to the UK, they encounter significant financial, cultural and institutional barriers that prevent them from attending university. So why should a university become a university of sanctuary? Becoming a university of sanctuary enriches campus life and academic discussion by bringing new perspectives and cultures together. And it brings a wealth of benefits to the university, its students, staff and local community. Some of these would include taking clear steps towards creating a university environment that's welcoming to all in a way that directly contributes to increasing inclusivity. By establishing a culture of welcome for people seeking sanctuary, where people feel valued and safe, there are wider benefits for the whole university community. Demonstrating a clear commitment to supporting equal access to higher education and assisting people from all walks of life to reach their potential. Extending the scope of widening access and widening participation work, particularly working with local refugee charities to identify the needs of local population of people seeking sanctuary. As expected, students would like their university to have good academic credentials, but student support for this movement, particularly at Southampton, reflects that they also expect a university to be compassionate and progressive in its approach. You'd be joining a dynamic network of universities that work to improve the culture of sanctuary in higher education and have the voice of the university heard as part of that collective. You'd be taking a practical public step towards inclusion and countering discourses of xenophobia and racism within and outside the university, which has never been more important. And the notion of sanctuary fits with the values and strategic plan of your university, including contributing to delivery of strategies relating to equality and social responsibility. We encourage any university to explore how it can meet the principles of becoming a university of sanctuary. And the notion requires a whole organisation approach, but it isn't one size fits all. Each institution varies in its strengths and context, so the approach that you would take would not be identical from any other university. So how would the University of Southampton become a University of Sanctuary? To work towards a commitment to become a University of Sanctuary, you would need to look at developing initiatives that align with City of Sanctuary's three core principles for awarding an organisation. So the first of those is to learn. So to develop and promote learning about what it means to be seeking sanctuary. A University of Sanctuary would develop teaching and learning on the themes of migration and sanctuary and include refugee issues as part of course syllabuses where relevant. 
It would also extend learning opportunities to people seeking sanctuary and find ways to learn from them, such as inviting them to share their experiences as part of professional training and courses. To embed, so to take positive action to embed concepts of welcome, safety and inclusion within the institution at all levels, of, such as the student body, faculty, senior management, in a way that ensures the initiative outlasts the current student population and will continue into the future. And to share, so to celebrate your vision, achievements and what you've learned and share your good practice with other universities, the local community and beyond. Events such as the inaugural Stephen Press Memorial Lecture last year are a great way for the university to share its work in respect of sanctuary. So in order for a university to demonstrate that it's a university of sanctuary, our steering group designed a set of minimum criteria each organisation would need to achieve. And I'm going to briefly describe these in a little detail. Some of them might be criteria you already recognise Southampton's working towards, or have achieved even. Others might be discussions that haven't yet taken place. So there would need to be the creation of a three-year plan to show how the university will continue to develop its culture of welcome. There would need to be a public commitment to City of Sanctuary's vision of welcome through the endorsement of our charter and signing up to the Southampton Group's pledge. There would need to be a web page dedicated to sanctuary initiatives and the commitment of the university to support these. There would need to be a commitment to take steps to minimise the impacts that changes in government legislation have on forced migrants applying for and attending university. There would need to be training and properly trained dedicated staff who act as a contact point for sanctuary students. This would include staff being aware of challenges faced by people seeking sanctuary particularly around mental health and practical challenges around immigration and the asylum system. And it could encompass welfare staff, admission staff, and also teaching staff. There would need to be sanctuary scholarships offered at undergraduate masters and or PhD level, which should be underpinned by the Article 26 guiding principles. There are many levels of support offered by an increasing number of universities across the UK including fee waivers, bursaries, scholarships, and classifying those currently seeking asylum as home students rather than international. But we have specifically made offering a ring-fenced full fee scholarships one of the minimum criteria for the award, because we feel it tackles the essence of the problem facing many people seeking sanctuary, that they cannot access student finance to pay for tuition or living costs, and are unable to work to support themselves. And therefore the value and impact of these scholarships can be huge. The University of Southampton does not currently offer any scholarships to people seeking sanctuary, nor any dedicated bursaries or other financial support to people in these circumstances. And these scholarships, if they were introduced, would need to be effectively communicated, both in the local community and through the University of Sanctuary Network and STAR Network, to ensure that they are taken up by the right people. There would need to be support for the establishment of a student-led awareness group on campus. And I know that the University of Southampton has a very active STAR group. I've had the pleasure of attending some of their events in previous years, and you'll be hearing from their president later on. There's also the active engagement with the wider community. So that would include people seeking sanctuary, living locally, and also the local City of Sanctuary network. I've heard via the local group some of the links that are being built, and I hope this can develop into a really strong partnership but I believe there's more to do to ensure the voice of people seeking sanctuary is centralised in these discussions going forward so that we can benefit from the wealth of knowledge they bring. And there would also need to be active engagement with the National University of Sanctuary scheme, including contributing the sharing of good practice and attendance at national conferences. City of Sanctuary held our first university conference in September last year and we're holding a further one in October this year, virtually, obviously. Um, it would be fantastic to have staff and student representatives from the University of Southampton to attend. So just before I wrap up my section, um, I was thinking about some things that could practically happen immediately at the university and things that could be done in the short term. Becoming a University of Sanctuary would not be an overnight process. It will take some time to bring everything together and to get approval for some of the new initiatives. But that doesn't mean work can't commence. And there are many things the university could be doing which would benefit people seeking sanctuary. So as some suggestions, setting up a University of Sanctuary working group, focusing on developing and implementing plans in a coordinated way, inclusive of students, staff from a variety of departments, including widening participation and teaching local people seeking sanctuary and the local city of sanctuary group which would bring together all the elements of the work currently taking place and assess what the university would need to do to achieve its ambition of becoming a university of sanctuary 
Beyond access to higher education, the university can work with local organisations such as CLEAR um, to look at how university facilities can be opened up to people seeking sanctuary, such as libraries, sports facilities and study spaces, and how the university as a key local employer can help local people seeking sanctuary access the job market when they're allowed to work. And to gain a commitment from senior management to support the University of Sanctuary initiative and publicise the plans to walk towards, work towards this ambition on local and campus media so that people are aware of your aim and can work with you to support this objective. Um, I think that's all I want to contribute at this time and I'll take some questions later in the question and answer session, but for now I'll hand back to Tess. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nicola. I think you've given us a really great starting point of both short and long term things that can be done to become a University of Sanctuary, which are uh, really useful for us as a university, but also others that may be wanting to become a University of Sanctuary to know. Um, for those who've just joined us, I can see our participants are at 90 now, so we've had a few joining. Um, we're just halfway through our, um, well, we're beginning our speaking presentations. Um, feel free to comment or ask questions in the chat box below or to tweet using the hashtag, hashtag Sanctuary Uni Soten. So thanks so much, Nicola. I'm going to pass over to our second speaker for today. Uh, so our second speaker is Tony Kushner. Tony is professor in the Parks Institute for the study of Jewish and non-Jewish relations and in the history department at the University of Southampton. He is a pioneer in writing refugee history, including the book Refugees in the Age of Genocide with Catherine Knox, which focuses specifically on those coming to Hampshire and local responses to them. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much, Tess. Southampton has been made by migrants and refugees especially have played a key role in its history. This is not immediately evident, but by walking you around its built heritage, I want to restore the, that past and use it to confront the present. It's an important past, but one that has been obscured, but something that the city, including the University of Southampton, can be proud of, warts and all, and for which the official sanctuary status will be part of a remarkable tradition. A good starting point is one of the few sites that recognises that refugees settled here, the Huguenot Garden in the Old City. Constructed in 1985 to mark the 300th anniversary of the arrival of these French refugees fleeing Catholic oppression, it is now faded. One of my themes then is following that of Black British artist Lubaina Chimig, reflecting on slavery in her hometown of Lancaster. She says, how do you talk about something that can be seen and be thought of as not being there, inside the invisible, if you like. And here is, or is not, uh, the foundation stone of the emigrant's home near the docks, a history obscured uh, by uh, wheelie bins and rubbish. This evening, I want to make Southampton's refugee past and present vibrant and visible. The Huguenots worshipped at the French church in Winkle Street, building on, an earlier on earlier Protestant refugees who came from the Low Countries from the 1560s, and by 1896 totaled 300, 7% of the town's population. Through their expertise in international trade and domestic industry, these Flemish refugees transformed Southampton's economy. This was not accidental. The town authorities had welcomed them on the understanding they would utilize their skills. As their historian notes, it was essentially a planted com community which was admitted on certain conditions, one of which was to limit their number to 100. That they didn't was to the benefit, benefit of the fast growing town. Their children became civic leaders in the 1600s and later that century, uh, the Huguenots were equally productive in the city, in, in the town, including the child refugee, Henri de Portal, printer to the Bank of England, and later hated for this by the racist radical William Cobbett. I will pause here as it seems my history of Southampton and its refugees is one of utilitarianism. But refugees come in all sizes. Some may even be very unpleasant. Take the vicious Argentinian dictator and genocide there, General Rosas, who found asylum in Southampton in the 1850s, living the remainder of his life here. 
His remains were taken back to Argentina in 1989. Its right-wing military leader saw Rosas as a usable past. My point is that he's still part of Southampton's refugee history. Granting asylum and sanctuary should not depend on future contributions refugees might make. Likewise, we must remember that England has created its own refugee movements. Southampton had an intimate connection to the Pilgrim Fathers, the memory of whom is, in, is ambiguous with regard to the devastating impact on the indigenous population. What now follows is a whirlwind photographic tour of Southampton and its refugees taken in the past few weeks with the emphasis on place. Just a few yard from, yards from General Rosas is the Jewish cemetery. In it are many of refugee origin. Here is the Millet family, uh, who, or one of their members who came from Galicia in the late 19th century and revolutionized the high street with army surplus and then outdoor wear. The anti-Semitic vandalism here shows that not all Southampton relishes its diverse past. And whilst one branch of the Millet family was successful in Southampton, coming out of the Sailor Town streets around Canal Walk, most of them failed in business. Not all refugees are rags to riches stories. In front of this Millet member in the Jewish cemetery is Boris Selesnov a two-year-old who was born and died in Atlantic Park Hostel, the present site of Southampton International Airport. But in the 1920s, the world's largest camp for, for transmigrant refugees, mainly Ukrainian Jews escaping civil war, famine and pogroms. There, once, there was once a photograph of Boris in this grave, uh, but it's been lost, as has largely the history of this camp. Instead, the arrival in 1937 of 4,000 Basque children in enough mass, another mass settlement of refugees a mile, north, a mile north to the airport has become more famous and at least has a plaque uh, in the Civic Center with also a rather strange memorial label camping at the old Ford Works. Other refugees stayed here very temporarily, including a party of Volga Germans who end, had ended up in Brazil in the late 1870s were housed in God's House Tower, first welcomed in the, in the town of Southampton, but within weeks rejected and sent home. And in the 1930s and beyond, other refugees from Nazism, Nazism arrived and transformed what was still University College Southampton. Most prominent was Karl Weisenberg, a prominent physicist, uh, who Albert Einstein got released from internment on the Isle of Man to enable his critical critical wall work. He lived at number seven, uh, which just happens to be next door to mine, where I'm talking to you now. Carl was brought to University College by the Academic Assistance Council, which helped over a thousand refugee scholars to come to Britain, with academics paying 1% of their salary to fund it, something that the city of Sanctuary can build upon. But there were many others, Martin Fleischmann in chemistry, Gabby Glantz in law, Eric Zeppler in, in uh, electronics, Edgar Feuchtwanger and Ernest Blake in my department in history. And the list could go on, including students such as Ben Helfgott, a child Holocaust survivor and later Olympic weightlifting champion. And there are others who were part of a tradition of welcome in town and gown. Most prominent was James Parks, a radical Anglican priest who helped many desperate Jewish refugees get to Britain. James Park Centre came to Southampton in 1965, uh, and its leading benefactor was Ian Carton, uh, here pictured uh, fighting for the RAF, another refugee who James Parks helped. In what is now the Parks building on Avenue Campus, there were collections of clothing for Ugandan refugees in the 1970s. And one of these, Arvind Bamini, became mayor of the, town, of the city in 2003. Finally, the lecture theatre in the Avenue Parks building was used as an internment camp for enemy aliens, essentially Jewish refugees, uh, in 1940, ironic given Parks' role in rescue and assisting their release from British governmental com confinement. I will close noting that there have been new generations of refugees settling or passing through Southampton in recent years. Whilst not forgetting their negative experiences and treatment, 
there is a long tradition of the city, its universities and its peoples, including scores of unsung committees and organizations welcoming refugees. In turn, these former victims of persecution have made Southampton, though their stories seldom told. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony, for this wonderful, these wonderful photos, which really provide such an evocative look at Southampton throughout the ages. Uh, and I think that uh, you've really shown us how refugees have been part of the fabric, not only of the city of Southampton, but the university, uh, which is really relevant to what we're discussing. Um, and also an important point there about uh, not stereotyping refugees and having criteria for why they need to come to a country, but that it is just our right uh, or the right of host of, of nations for um, of host nations or people that are signatory to the refugee convention to uh, to provide asylum to people regardless of um, whether they contribute in the ways that they think they should or not. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I'd like to pass now to our second, our third speaker, um, Maria Ahmed. Maria is a medical student from the University of Southampton. She has been actively involved for two years as president and on the committee of the Southampton branch of Student Action for Refugees, a national network, a national student network seeking to improve conditions for refugees in the UK. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who came today, especially to those who helped organise the event. Um, so as Tess mentioned, I've been a part of um, Student Action for Refugees for two years now. Um, aside from running community events and raising money for refugees and asylum seekers, our society has also run a campaign called the Equal Access Campaign, which has been urging our university to provide scholarships and bursaries for those um, seeking asylum to come and study here. Um, so as Nicola mentioned previously, um, these students do not get student finance and they're also considered international students. So they're charged a far higher tuition fee amount, which can be as high as £58,000 a year uh, for an undergraduate degree. Uh, Postgraduate degrees can go a lot higher. Um, so all of this bars them from accessing higher education. Um, so in order to appreciate why becoming a university or sanctuary is so important, it should be recognised that universities aren't just schools that give us degrees at the end. Um, they're key institutions within society. So the graduates they produce will go on to take up positions in our society where they can either uphold the current status quo, which as current events have shown is rife with racism and inequality, or they can help tackle these issues and create a more inclusive society. So committing to becoming a university or sanctuary won't just lead to changes in that individual's life, it will have far reaching impacts on the rest of us. Um, giving myself an example, I come from a background which is underrepresented in the medical community. I'm a person from a low socioeconomic background who's the first in their family to go to university. It's unlikely I would have received a place in medical school were it not for the BM6 course. So this is a course that's designed to widen participation in medicine to underrepresented groups by providing a foundation year with extra financial and pastoral support so the students are able to go and join the rest of the medical cohort. So this course has created hundreds of doctors who now better understand the needs of the population they care for, as well as bringing attention to and fixing problems within the system that otherwise would not have been picked up on. This example illustrates how creating a supportive, welcoming environment that allows all the students to realise their potential doesn't just benefit them, it benefits all of us. The BM6 students I've met have come from a range of backgrounds some from an asylum seeking background, others with experience of being cared for by local authorities. Their stories bring new and often unseen perspectives to our discussion and they've definitely enriched our student experience. It's opened my eyes to problems I didn't even know existed beforehand. It's also helped diversify our campus. The biggest way to further globalise our university and enhance the cultural exposure to students is by removing direct and indirect barriers and making a commitment to inclusivity. Things like xenophobia and prejudice come from ignorance or misconception. Indirectly barring a whole group of people from being able to attend our university only perpetuates these issues both in and outside of campus life. So some of the steps we can, make, uh, we can take to make this happen. So removing the barriers to education. 
So as Nicola mentioned before, this will include um, doing things like providing full scholarships and bursaries, including fee waivers. So these students can actually take up their place at university. Um, our equal access campaign was met with a response from the university last year who said, after careful consideration, a scholarship program like this would cost upwards of £100,000 per student, so it's not feasible at the moment. Um, I'm not sure what calculator they were using, but that amount was grossly inflated. Um, providing a student with free university-owned accommodation and a Unilink bus pass would cost little to nothing for the university. Um, we also, I also want to mention actually how it's important we don't provide cash bursaries for these students, as it will actually stop the small weekly benefits they're given. Um, in fact, it would be more um, useful to set up a fund where they can apply for resources like laptops and the university uses this fund to provide them with the resources directly. Um, it's also important to provide them with a staff member who acts as a point of call and support and the staff member should be someone trained in supporting those seeking sanctuary, um, both on university, in university life and in society. Um, there's a lot of people seeking asylum who don't get what you know, don't get the things that they're entitled to because there's misconception, um, especially in healthcare. There's a lot of um, uh, refugees and asylum seekers who don't get the healthcare they're entitled to because healthcare staff aren't aware that they're entitled to free health healthcare. Um, it's also important to create a campus culture that is welcoming. So this can be done through organising events for Refugee Week. Um, traditionally, it's held in June, but it might be more useful for universities to do it early in the year where more students are on campus. Um, and things like workshops and events designed to engage and educate staff and students on forced migration should be organised. And creating a training programme for staff, especially those who work closely with students seeking sanctuary. Um, it's also important to work with the city council to create a culture of welcome in the city. Um, that can be done through things like supporting children in the city who are seeking asylum, uh, supporting them through school, creating outreach programs for them, or widening access courses specifically designed for these students. Um, the last thing I wanted to note is how we can all help make this happen. So all of us here have privilege, and by recognising it, we can use our privilege to create change. I speak the language of the country I live in. I can be sure any services I require will have someone who speaks the same language as me and is able to help me. When I go to the doctor, I don't have to worry about taking a translator. I know that they'll be able to communicate with me. I'm at university. I have access to resources and education that others are indirectly barred from. And we have to use our privilege to speak up for those that cannot, whether that's by sending an email to our university to put pressure on them to become a university of sanctuary, or creating petitions and campaigning to enact change in government legislation. There's a lot to be done, but between all of us, we have more than enough power to achieve this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria, for that presentation. I think you've really highlighted there how universities can be role models, can and should be role models uh, of the wider values in society that, uh, that, they, that they would like to see uh, and, should, and can be very active parts of the communities and cities that they are within. Uh, and I think that's a really important point that you mentioned too about the cash bursary. So thank you for saying that uh, around the, the practicalities of how we can make sure that we're not further actually making things complicated for people that we're seeking to support. Um, I'll keep, mo keep moving, just in the interest of time. Um, also, just uh, for those who are, um, are joining us, uh, I'm not sure if there's people who've just come in, but we're about halfway through our speaker presentations. Uh, feel free to comment or ask questions in the chat. Um, it's great if you can uh, start asking questions even now, um, because they'll start to stack up in the Q&A and it'll be easier uh, it will lighten the load on David and Ignacio of people. If you have any burning questions for those uh, speakers that have uh, already gone, please start uh, writing those questions in now so that we can get those questions in. Um, so, uh, and also tweeting, as we put in the chat box, tweeting at uh, hashtag Sanctuary Uni Soten. Um, and great call to action there as well, Maria, for how we can all get involved. Okay, so I'm just gonna pass to our fourth speaker today, uh, Mike Brown. Mike has worked in the refugee sector for 18 years. He is the manager of CLEAR, an independent charity providing people seeking asylum, uh, refugees and EU migrants in Southampton with free professional advice, English lessons and practical help. He's also the secretary of the City of Sanctuary Southampton Group. Thank you, Mike. Okay, hi. <clears throat> yeah, um, 
a little bit of history about CLEAR. Uh, CLEAR is part of City Life Church and has, is now in its 20th year. Uh, and so we work with asylum seekers and refugees in Southampton. And if I had to distill the aims of CLEAR into three words, it would be advocate, educate, and empower. Half of what we do is advice in various forms, and the other half is education in various forms. And we have uh, 12 employees part-time, we have um, freelance tutors, and we have about 50 employees. Our funding comes mainly from the National Lottery, but also from the City Council, and uh, we're very grateful for the City Council's help. As Tony mentioned before, multiculturalism is in the DNA of Southampton and the council reflects that in the investment that they make in, uh, in new communities. Um, <clears throat> so um, we bring a, a voice to those people who haven't got a voice. But while we're doing that, we build up their skills um, towards independence and fulfilling their, uh, their true potential. Um, and in this regard, I think that Maslow's hierarchy that you're probably familiar with is very useful, uh, a very useful model to understand both the extent of the loss that's been suffered by our clients and also the path towards um, rebuilding their lives in the UK. So um, our clients are people whose uh, entire hierarchy of needs has been completely bulldozed and they have had to flee their country in order to seek protection and an asylum seeker typically arrives in the UK with nothing but the clothes they stand up in. Um, now the Home Office provide very basic accommodation and a, a meagre subsistence uh, whilst their claim is being uh, considered. So they, they, they try to take care of the the physiological needs, the base level of Maslow's hierarchy. Asylum seekers, of course, are not, pre are not permitted to work, so they have no means of, of supplementing that meager income. <clears throat> so at CLEAR, we start by calling the Home Office to account where support for an asylum seeker is arbitrarily removed or refused. But our focus is also on those higher levels of Maslow's hierarchy. We, we concern ourselves with health and education, employment, friendship, self-expression, and belonging, because belonging is what uh, we want um, our, our clients to achieve. And we do that in collaboration with our sister organizations in Southampton. We want to change the weather for asylum seekers and refugees. But we also want to change the climate. And for that, we have common cause with many other organizations, which are human rights organizations around the country, including City of Sanctuary nationally and, um, and, and the Lift the Ban Coalition campaigning for asylum seekers to be allowed to earn money to supplement their income. Um, and City of Sanctuary is vitally important in that because it's um, working towards a culture of welcome where it's everyone's responsibility to help refugees who come to Southampton to make their home here. Um, that's all I wanted to say for now. Thank you so much, Mike, for those comments. It's really interesting to hear more about CLEAR's work. And I think you've done a great job of connecting uh, all of these different bodies, including City of Sanctuary, to show how important it is that we all work together through these, um, through these organizations to think about all of these different factors that are involved uh, in ensuring that um, people seeking sanctuary um, have, uh, have have a fulfilling life, uh, including not just basic needs, but also issues of belonging and how, how they can fit into uh, wider society. Um, so I think that's, uh, yeah, re really very interesting. Thank you. 
Um, just to pass on to our next speaker, um, and also to uh, to say my what seems to be my uh, getting quite repetitive reminder. Sorry, but uh, keep dropping questions and into the chat box and tweeting at. Uh, hashtag Sanctuary Uni Soton. I'm a new tweety person, so this is all new to me. Um, so um, our next speaker, uh, our fifth speaker for today is Esther Adelecki. Esther is a tenacious and resourceful mother of two from Nigeria, where she graduated in public administration. She came to the UK in 2014 and her asylum claim is still ongoing. In the UK, she studied nursing and midwifery, and then community health and social care at the University of Winchester, which was possible through a Winchester Sanctuary Award. I just clicked it on. Whoop, we've got a mic there. <laughs> That's all right, it's gone. So um, it was possible through a Winchester Sanctuary Award. She co-presented the deputation, which established Southampton as a city of sanctuary in 2017. Thanks so much for joining us, Esther. I'll hand over to you. Um, and nice to be on this uh, platform. It's an opportunity for me, and uh, I will forever grateful for this opportunity. Um, I am an asylum seeker. I have experienced and um, have experienced a lot of stigma and prejudice. I've gone through a lot. I suffer from depression and anxiety. Uh, my life has, uh, was kind of uh, difficult for me. I, like, I, I don't have any hope. And I've lost everything after the death of my husband. I'm leaving me with uh, two kids to cater for. And I have no money. I have no hope. I don't have anywhere to go. I came to the um, United Kingdom for fear of my life or my home country, Nigeria. And... On arriving to United Kingdom, I have no accommodation, no right, and I, I still have fear for my life. Um, all this was ongoing before I now seek asylum. And we have, we've gone through a lot. Later, I then realized that nothing is going to change because the only thing, the main thing I do is dropping off my children from school. Then I come back home doing nothing. So I realized nothing's going to change, except I motivate myself and move on. Why I await my, um, my uh, status uh, coming through. So I was able to get help from Clare Project and Southampton Winchester and, uh, Visitors Group, which they supported so, us with accommodation. Um, getting settling down in uh, Southampton because uh, we'll be moving from Croydon to Cardiff, from Cardiff to Southampton. So when I arrived in Southampton, it was like, um, I don't know where I, I am. And uh, there was no hope for me. But this group have really supported me. So after I was going for counseling, I was advised to be going to be keeping myself busy. So I approached Claire Projects and they sponsored me in doing so many courses. And after that, I think I cannot stop that. I still have to keep on pressing on. So I went to Ichen College to study access to nursing. And along the line, I was able to gain admission to University of Winchester to study nursing, mental health nursing. There was no hope for me because um, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I, do, I cannot assess any uh, finance or any uh, loan as an international student. That's the way we were kind of uh, classified. So I was so happy when I get to know about Sanctuary Award. So I went through the process and eventually I got the award 2019 to study health and community and learning disability in Winchester. I couldn't start study nursing and I was offered a substitute course. So I don't want to miss this opportunity. I don't want to let my dream go through like that. I said, okay, if I can't study nursing because of my status, then I'll go for that course. I really mean to 
have my dream come true and to be able to, co to contribute to the, to the community. So after all those things, I was able to gain the, uh, the admission and, uh, and attend every available courses. And I, I, I was so grateful because it was a great privilege to be able to assess the Sanctuary Award. And initially, I went to so many universities. I applied to University of Southampton to study mental health nursing. And fortunately for me, I was granted the admission. But unfortunately, I couldn't attend Southampton University because I cannot assess the Sanctuary Award in the university. In fact, during my interview, the head of the nursing department, he asked that I should find out why Southampton Uni cannot let students uh, assess Sanctuary Award. So which left me with um, unanswered question. So I have to go on with my dream to study the course I was offered at a university. So I was so happy when this when this topic came up, there is an opportunity for me because there are a lot of people in my shoe that really want to pursue their dream. They really want to go further. But because of the, um, the locality and some other aspects, they couldn't do that. So if Southampton Uni can become sanctuary, uh, sanctuary University, it's going to be a great privilege. Like for example, I live in Southampton, so I have to travel to uh, Winchester every day, four times a week. At times, it's a bit difficult for me getting down to the uni because um, if I miss my train or there is any delay, I won't be able to meet up with the, course, with the class. But if it's in Southampton, it makes life easy for me because I got two children, I have to drop them off in school before going to, to uni. So if I were to be, I was given the opportunity to study at the University of Southampton. It could have made life easier for me which I, which I hope they will consider if they can be sanctuary uh, university. Another thing is um, sense of belonging. You know, when you leave and uh, going to school or university, it's not difficult for you. It motivates people and it's a great opportunity to be a student in uh, Southampton University or any sanctuary university around. But for a lot of people that live around this area, considering traveling to other parts of the country may be difficult for them and may kind of kill their dream in pursuing their goal or achieving their, their aim. And in terms of finance, it's, it's going to brought the scope of students that will go to university. For example, Winchester can only take five hours this in a year. If Southampton Uni can be part of the sanctuary university, it will enlarge the scope, like they have another five students they're going to give hope to you. They're going to give them, you know, um, future, a, a great future because they will be able to pursue their dream. They will be able to go and study any of the course they wish to, to do. And uh, it gives one sense of belonging. It makes one to think, now I'm in the uni because my life, my orientation, everything about me changed. Immediately I gained admission to the university. I look to the future with hope. Even though I'm still awaiting my start of my life to remain, but I hope that by the time I eventually get through, I'm going to be relevant in the community. I'll be able to contribute. I will be able to see what I can do to help people that are being in my shoe because I have the experience, I know what it is. And because when one is waiting, it's a very difficult time. You don't know what is going to happen fear, anxiety, depression, you know, when you hear dog post uh, letter coming through your, your post, you, you kind of, your heart jumps up. But going to university and the Southampton Uni to be one of the universities is going to give more people hope. And I've been kind of telling lots of people that I know, motivating them. And I have two of them now at HN College doing uh, uh, functional skills in English. And if we have more universities to join Sanctuary University, it will encourage more people, it will give people hope. And they will be able to be stabilized in the new economy, the uh, eco uh, communities that will find ourselves. That's that for now.
Thank you so much, Esther, for sharing that very personal story. Um, it's very moving. And I just wanted to say to all the speakers, actually, but particularly Esther, there's a lot of people commenting, um, saying thank you in the, um, in the comments, in the chat box. So have a look um, and that you're a great mo role model. Um, and, uh, and personally as well, I wanted to say yes. Uh, you're, it's amazing the perseverance that you've shown uh, and it's great how you're continuing to help uh, the other people seeking sanctuary in that community. And I think you've really highlighted how important the sanctuary awards are um, in what they enabled for you, but also the barriers that can uh, occur if we don't have um, sanctuary awards or sanctuary universities. And, and uh, obviously it would have been a lot easier for you living in Southampton to have been able to go to the University of Southampton and to help you with that feeling of belonging to the city in which you live in with your children. Uh, so I think you've given us very clear reasons for why universities of sanctuary and sanctuary awards are important. Thank you for sharing. Um, so now we'll just go to our last speaker for the, uh, for the round table, uh, which is Steve Leggett. Steve Leggett is the councillor for Fremantle. Steve got elected in 2018 as a local Labour councillor in Southampton, and he holds the cabinet portfolio for Green City and Place. As councillor for Fremantle, he, he has engaged with local church groups in discussion with people seeking asylum and refugees. He has also been a student at University of Winchester since 2015 studying a BA in Global History Politics and an MA in Politics and International Relations. Thank you, Steve, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Tess, thank you very much. Um, um, and thank you for inviting me today to be part of your important event. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, all the people behind the scenes, which we can't see, they're doing a great job, very efficient, so thank you to them as well. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Um, I wanted to just touch on the first time I really heard about um, Sanctuary Cities, actually. Um, you may remember, it seems a long time ago now, but during the 2016 US presidential election, four years ago, um, Donald Trump, he delivered a speech on immigration vowing to dismantle Sanctuary Cities in the US. And that became a hot topic in that presidential campaign. Um, and he was utilizing the classic dog whistle politics, threatening all sorts of financial penalties. Um, against cities that did not comply with federal anti-immigration legislation. Um, and that, that, um, that sort of uh, drive in the US for sanctuary cities was, came through the 1980s um, with the um, asylum seekers that were coming out of Central and South America. And I think as Tony, Tony mentioned, uh, Southampton has a long history actually um, of welcoming re refugees who have contributed and been integral in shaping our society all around us. Um, Southampton itself became a city of sanctuary in July 2017. Um, I wasn't elected then, I was sat in the, um, in the public gallery when it happened um, and it was at full council meeting in the chamber uh, of Southampton City Council and the city of sanctuary Southampton delivered a deputation to full council and asked them to recognise and endorse that Southampton is a city of sanctuary and this was accepted by the council. Um, so that was in 2017 um, and since that time there's been quite a lot of engagement with I, I think someone also mentioned you know once, once you get to that status you don't just stop there you continue the process uh, with different organizations across the city including um, theatres and schools in fact um, just before um, I came to this meeting I had a discussion with my fellow cabinet member for education we have 15 sanctuary schools now in the city and to learn and share what it means to be seeking sanctuary um, and embed and share the concepts of welcome. I, I'm a governor of a primary school in Southampton. Uh, in our school we've got 400, well we don't have 400 children at the moment but we normally do, um, and we have 48 languages being uh, spoken in that school. So we want to work together to make Southampton a warm and welcome place for refugees and asylum seekers. So for us, we have got some core aims um, and it's working with agencies and businesses, stakeholders in the city, voluntary community. We have a very strong voluntary community uh, network here in the city, social enterprise groups in Southampton to make it a welcoming city for all and particularly for refugees and asylum seekers who have chosen to make Southampton their home, their city. 
um, we want to help empower and encourage asylum seekers and refugees to their local communities and to UK society and to challenge hostility and discrimination against all of them. We want to continue to publicise and celebrate the contribution of asylum seekers and refugees to their local communities and to the UK society and culture and to challenge hostility and discrimination against them. We want to empower and encourage asylum seekers and refugees to take their full part in UK society to reach their own personal potential and give asylum seekers and refugees a voice in the local media. I mean, you know, um, this is really important and usually doesn't get heard very well. So coming back to Tess, you mentioned about when I got elected, I, I'm quite a late developer when it comes to politics, shall we say. Um, but I decided to stand and I got elected in 2018, which is a great honour. Um, and I represent my residents in Fremantle, is where I live. I've lived for 23 years and I get to represent them. So what does a council do all day? Well, the role of a council is to be a member of the council, um, providing leadership and engaging in the decision-making process by overviewing and scrutinising council strategies and policies. The council will also engage with local residents, and I've been doing a lot of that today and this week, actually. Um, and the wider city local uh, um, local community. So to that end, I wanted to just share with you an experience I had last year. I was invited to attend a what we call a listening event uh, for asylum seekers and refugees that was organised by local church groups. It was at the Avenue Church, St Andrew's Church. Um, I was invited to come along um, basically to listen, uh, to hear what people had to say about their experiences coming to Southampton um and you know engage with them um so i heard some very troubling issues during this this uh, listening event um around all sorts of topics many many um areas housing employment transport education and esther very passionately outlined some some issues there as well which i i heard as well and it was at this event um that i heard the the, the issue about university of sanctuary and I have to say, I didn't know much about it. And uh, so I went away and did some research about it. So I, there was, a, there was a, um, um, a person at the listening event who told me about the fact that the University of Southampton was not a University of Sanctuary and the University of Winchester was. Um, and as Tess mentioned, I, I decided as a mature student to go back to university in 2015 to Winchester. I've always found Winchester a wonderful um, uh, education and just a wonderful community and I've been there five years I think they're going to kick me out eventually but anyway I'm still there at the moment um, so I did some some sort of background into it and I saw that you know um, you know why why would the University of Southampton not want to do this so I made some inquiries with my fellow cabinet members and councillors and there seemed to be some resistance um, then I did a bit more research and I thought to myself, well, maybe it's, maybe it's due to um, how these two universities have been founded. What, what, how, where did they come from? So Winchester is, is quite a unique education establishment. Um, if you look at when it was founded, it was founded in 1860, uh, two years before Southampton. Um, and it's part of the Cathedrals Group, um, which is a collection of church universities and colleges. Um, so as a very strong uh, religious um, values foundation um, and I just wanted to quote you from the the 2019-2020 student handbook of Winchester which I'm still a student so I do get a copy of that and it says in here about we value the opinions views and well-being of individuals as well as our intellectual freedom diversity and creativity we celebrate our Christian foundation by welcoming people of all faiths and none and seek to promote social justice. And it has a very strong uh, theme through that. Um, whereas when you look at the history of the University of Southampton, it does not have that same foundation. I, I'm not saying that that is the reason for this situation. I just think it is an element of it. Um, and I know Winchester, their values are very clear. It's about compassion, individuals, and spirituality. spirituality. So to finish, um, and I think this is the important part, is what can we do to convince the University of Southampton to become a sanctuary university? I think there are some opportunities at the moment with a new vice chancellor. Um, Tess outlined that there is a, there is a, 
uh, growing de demand um, campaign with um, academic staff and also with um, students. I would really, really strongly advise that you engage with your local councillors, um, local politicians um, would make it a much stronger um, campaign. Now the University of Southampton is a very important um, institution within Southampton. It's what we call an anchor institution. Um, and we work very closely with the University of Southampton. Um, for example, when we launched our Green City Charter last year, uh, which commits the, the city, uh, commits the council to becoming carbon neutral by 2030, um, plus a whole load of things about the climate emergency, University of Southampton is a founded signatory. Um, so they are writing their own um, Green City Charter plan to meet those objectives. So, so uh, and maybe in different departments, different faculties, there, there is a different feeling. Um, but I, I would say that, you know, uh, there needs to be buy-in from the top to make this work. So on that note, I will stop. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself just then. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Uh, that was really interesting to hear more again about the history of, um, of Southampton. Um, and I think you've, uh, you've really highlighted, I mean, the Cathedrals Group also very interesting to know about. Um, and I think you really highlighted there uh, the role. I think uh, this, this, um, this idea of the anchor institution is a really powerful concept that we can think with around what the University of Southampton can do and what kind of message it's sending out. Um, and it is very important to have that buy-in from the top um, so it would be good to talk about that a little bit more in the Q&A. Um, but also, of course, um, this momentum that we're generating can hopefully help with, um, with, with generating that. Um, and uh, it's good to hear that we've got you on board as a local politician. And uh, I think that's a really good suggestion to involve local politicians in publicising this. And that links in with what Maria said as well about publicising more and Nicola as well, publicising more. Um, and getting the community all on board in a movement towards achieving this. So that actually brings us um, fairly much on time, which I'm proud of. Well done, speakers, um, to the conclusion of our presentation part of the Q&A. Um, I'd like to now just briefly um, bring up Terry Sanderson. Um, Terry is going to be making some closing remarks after the Q&A portion of the roundtable, but I'd just like to introduce her to you now because she will also be happy to be answering questions throughout the Q&A, so it would be nice for you to put a face to the name when she's uh, part of the Q&A panel. So Terry has worked in higher education for 17 years, and in 2009 she set up Winchester's scholarship scheme for students who are forced migrants. She is chair of Winchester's Forced Migration Network for staff, supporting people seeking sanctuary, a member of the committees of Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole City of Sanctuary and Southampton City of Sanctuary. She is also a member of the National Steering Group for Universities of Sanctuary. Thanks for joining us, Terry. I'll hand over to you now. Thanks very much, Tess. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, I'm really delighted to be here because, as you mentioned, I'm a member of the steering group for University of Sanctuary. And just to note that we also have Ben Hudson in the audience uh, for this event, who is one of my fellow steering group members at the Hudson Arts University as well. Um, so, from just one of you, um, it is interesting um, what Terry is saying about the individual's group and where we came from. Terry, I'm, Terry just I'm, just I'm so sorry. We're having um, a real problem with your sound. I wonder if maybe if you were to go out of the Zoom and come back in or to mute and unmute again and we can see if maybe that might resolve some of the audio, but we're just getting a really broken up sound at the moment, unfortunately. Let's just take a moment to try and fix that. Okay, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Much, that's much better. Thank you very okay. much, Terry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. 
surface original version, which um, it sort of runs out of originally quickly. And so I've probably gone dark now on the screen, but uh, anyhow, what I was saying was, um, yes, uh, Tony is absolutely right. When we first started offering scholarships back in 2009, we were one of the first two universities in the country to do that, along with Chester. And it was because we were part of the cathedral group. Um, but what's interesting is that at Southampton is that the initial impetus absolutely came top down from our vice chancellor, whereas Southampton is having to work from bottom up. So it is a different scenario. Um, we uh, started offering uh, bursaries and tuition fee waivers in 2009. We've had over 30 students now through the scheme and currently we offer five awards a year um, and students are studying a wide range of programs across the university. Um, about 14 now have graduated so far with more due to graduate this year. So it really has been a very successful uh, scheme in terms of the scholarship. Um, but also we um, have a network of staff, we call it our forced migration network, which I chair. Um, and these are staff and a few research students who are actively involved in teaching or research or outreach, um, who come together to share what we do, make connections, both within the university and outside. Um, so uh, some of those connections are global as well, uh, especially in terms of our research, but also in terms of knowledge exchange. So as you probably know, we have a big teacher education program and there's a major focus on supporting teachers to be able to teach inclusively in relation to refugee children. Um, and also our social work programme has um, a strong emphasis on supporting um, unaccompanied asylum seeker children who are in the care system. Um, but we've also been running outreach now for um, over three years, uh, including an annual residential for unaccompanied asylum seeking young children um, and events for Syrian families who live in the Hatcher area. Um, and lots of staff get involved as volunteers, as well as those who actually run the events themselves. Um, so becoming a University of Sanctuary uh, for us um, was not um, a laborious process because it was really about bringing together and documenting what we were already doing and then making a more coherent plan for how we would continue to do that in the future. Um, so I'm just really pleased to be here today to um, support the events, but also to offer any support or help that I can to anybody at Southampton who would like to learn from our experience at Winchester. Every university is different, every scheme is different, um, but uh, sharing practice is, is really helpful and um, we are continuing to learn as well from universities who are entering this terrain much later in the journey um, because all of our students are unique, they all have unique circumstances and there's a real need to, to learn about that from each other. So I'm really pleased to be here and thank you for letting me come. Thank you so much, Terry. Uh, you're a, a wealth of knowledge for us and we're, we're really happy to have you here to share your best practice um, and to have your support. And I think there's some wonderful things that it sounds like Winchester is doing that uh, provides some great, um, some great uh, examples for Southampton. Um, so with that, we're now going to move into um, the next part of our, our round table now. So I'd just like to thank all of the speakers for, for providing such a lot of food for thought and discussion now. Um, so, we can really see through all of these uh, presentations, I think, that people seeking sanctuary really form part of Southampton's identity um, through the history that we saw, but also continuing into today. Um, and that there are really clear benefits uh, and also really clear steps uh, for what we can do next to try and become a university of sanctuary. Um, so uh, I'd just like to remind people um, 
that uh, we're going to, so now we're moving into a Q&A for the next 30 minutes. Keep your questions coming if you have any in the chat box. Keep tweeting at hashtag Sanctuary Uni Soton. Um, so uh, David Owen is now going to lead us in our first um, round of questions to the panel. So we'll bring the panel up as a little gallery. Hopefully you can see all of us together. Um, and just to introduce David, David Owen is a professor of uh, social and political philosophy at the University of Southampton, and he's very dedicated to uh, making the University of Sanctuary happen. He was he gave the Stephen Press Memorial Lecture last year that Nicola referred to, um, and he's been on board with this um, prior to me coming to the university. It was a nice synergy between us because um, I'm a real newbie. I only started a few months ago or back in October. Um, so he's been keeping track of the questions with Ignacia, and he's now going to start us off with a few questions um, for the, uh, from the audience. So I'm just going to hand over uh, to David now, and please keep, feel free to keep going with the questions. Thank you very much, David. Hi, hi. Um, much enjoyed listening to everybody and following the, the chat. Um, I'm just going to start off with a couple of uh, slightly more technical questions to to uh, Nicola and Terry. Um, so just to kind of group them, the first is, um, is priority given to local candidates with regard to sanctuary bursaries, i.e. for us people from Southampton, or is it open competition via sanctuary and star networks? Uh, another second question, um, from my experience working, with refugees trying to get into university, the key challenge is overcoming the criteria of having to show transcripts of school exams or university results in their countries of or origin. Uh, how do you get over that um, problem? And, and then finally, um, a question about, are there um, different bureaucratic requirements for refugees coming from different parts of the world? Um, which uh, have implications for the kinds of bursaries and scholarships that need to be offered. So if we just take that little group uh, first for Nicola and Terry, and then we'll move to some more general questions. Thank you, David. Um, so Nicola and Terry, and um, after that, if anyone from the panel wants to jump in on them, if you've got anything, please feel free to add. So Nicola and Terry, thank you. Should I kick off, Nicola? Yeah, do you want to kick off with the technical side of things? You're, <laughs> okay. you're definitely more of an expert on the university technical side than I am. <laughs> okay, and Ben might want to add comments in the chat at the same time. Um, in terms of giving priority to local students, um, each university can absolutely set their own uh, eligibility requirements and priorities in terms of what they name their award, how they offer it. Um, at Winchester, we say that we give priority to students that already live within easy commuting distance of the university. Um, several reasons for doing that. Um, one is that it actually li limits the number of applications that we have, although I don't think that would be an issue in the future if Southampton comes on board with um, Sanctuary Awards. Um, but it's also to... Um, deter people who are living in home office accommodation in other parts of the country from applying to Winchester because the home office will not move them for the purpose of study. And um, if they choose to move and come out of their home office accommodation, there is a huge risk in that, that they may not then be rehoused by the home office. Um, for example, if they dropped out of study or withdrew for any reason. Um, so we, we make it a priority, uh, but we don't exclude applications from elsewhere. So if we still have space in a particular year, we will take a student from elsewhere as long as we think that it's in their interests and they're not jeopardising any home office support. So that's my comment on the first question. Um, Nicola, dive in if you've anything to add. Yeah, I, I would just add to that that obviously each university can set its own schemes for scholarships, as Terry's referenced. Um, but what I have seen some universities do is actually 
work in partnership with local refugee charities um, and local charities supporting people seeking sanctuary to actually look at what those criteria can be and should be um, in terms of what's the demand like, what kind of courses, what kinds of scholarships, and actually then work to tailor that to make it something that actually does work for people locally who are seeking sanctuary, but not necessarily excluding people more widely than that, but actually working with partners locally to make it something that is feasible for those who are already in the local area. Thank you. The second question was about um, transcripts and problems for um, people who have come from overseas. Um, to be honest, at Winchester, we have rarely encountered that situation because either the students are young, in which case they've come here sometimes even as young as five and are still in the situation where they can't access student finance because they're on that family 10-year route to settlement, although the rules have changed a bit since then. Um, but if they come, as many do, in their mid-teens, as unaccompanied asylum-seeking young people, then they normally go to college um, or may have gone into secondary school. And so they do get British qualifications before applying. And often we find that they're applying to us at the age of about 20 um, because it's taken longer for them to get through their GCSE and A-levels, to be or whatever to get to that point. So for young people, it's not an issue. For mature students, the, the vast majority that we have had have been like Esther and have come through an access to HE route. And that has included some who've um, actually achieved quite a, a reasonably high level of education in their country of origin, but have decided to do an access course or something similar to bring them up to the sort of academic English level to then enter university. Um, it's fair to say that probably a university like Winchester is more able to be flexible about entry qualifications than the more competitive universities like Southampton. So that would be something to look at. Um, yeah, just, are, sorry, just to add to that as well, when I'm not working for City of Sanctuary, I actually work for, for Mike at Clear as an employment advisor um, and assist people who are applying to university and um, thinking about their options and things like that. And very much that can be a conversation that's had with admissions departments at different universities in terms of what evidence someone is able to provide of their attendance in prior education. Um, but as Terry referenced, a lot of people um, who need who want to go to university who've previously attended university or higher education overseas will want to do some kind of access course or English course or something to bring them to the level of academic English and familiarise themselves with how university works in the UK, the sort of expectations around academic requirements, how essays are written, that kind of thing in, in a UK environment, which actually then provides them with some supporting qualifications, enabling them to then go through a mainstream application process and, and get them the, the points that they might need to actually go through a, a UCAS form or something similar. And I think that sort of encompasses the third question as well, David, which was about people coming from different parts of the world. Um, I think, again, most of our students at Winchester have been here for a number of years already. Um, the, the, probably the shortest time for anyone to have been here before the point of applying to university is about 18 months, and that's pretty rare. So um, there hasn't been any difference in terms of what country they've come from. And we've had students, I think, now from 18 different countries uh, since 2010, when our first student came to us. Thanks very much. Um, that also addressed uh, an another question we had coming up later, which is about um, how do you ensure that students from different educational environments um, may have the kind of relevant skills for UK educational um, environments, i.e. access courses, foundation courses, ways of introducing people. A couple of questions now which are kind of pitched to, to Maria in the first instance, but which I think are actually kind of more general questions as well. Um, so the first is, 
how do we make sure that becoming a university of sanctuary does not get co-opted as a marketing platform for university managements while we're still compelled to participate in the hostile environment e.g through attendance monitoring being reported you know are there special strategies to adopt and then the second is um how can we ensure that future students will have the same passion for change and they'll, they'll continue to be supportive towards uh, the sanctuary movement? Um, how does STAR plan to raise more awareness on the importance of refugees and asylum seekers having a better and easier route to achieving their goals and dreams? So those were in the chat box directed to Maria, but obviously others may wish to come in on them as as well um i'll answer the second one first i'm probably better better able to answer that one um so that's so you know making sure students stay passionate about it and kind of keep furthering the movement i think that's a lot to do with changing the campus culture so making it a campus that's inclusive and welcoming so you know ideally a university of sanctuary would be doing these things but because it's not yet um, it kind of relies on student societies to do that. So for example, um, we do things throughout the year, like various events, um, not all of them to do with um, uh, asylum seekers or, seeking, uh, or refugees. So for example, um, we did have one planned this year before uh, COVID took hold. Um, we were gonna do a big, um, a big iftar with um, another society. So basically it would have been during Ramadan, um, and it would have been a big dinner for all students to come and um, it would have been a nice way for you know Muslim students to break their fast and non-Muslims to learn about different cultures and it would have been a big you know a cultural event with loads of different um, sites coming together um, unfortunately that didn't pan out but things like that kind of show students how you know how having different cultures is beneficial for all of us and through these events we can then speak to students and um, tell them a little bit about what we do um, and you know things like bake sales we have throughout the year raising money for the charities we work with or for the activities we do we tend to have our petitions there so even some students they may not want to buy a cake or anything but they'll come and they learn about what we do so I think it's even if your university is not supporting you it's about you as a society taking it upon you to be visible on campus so you create events you create a presence on campus and by doing that more people are going to get involved more people are going to change their mindset and I think that furthers it oh, sorry. Um, Shall I come I just on the, the first question if I just come in a little bit on that I'm sure others might have a view as well um, but I think in respect of the the concept of universities of sanctuary being sort of co-opted as a marketing platform I think you can also look at it the other way that actually universities are big institutions, as Steve said, in, in Southampton, the University of Southampton is one of the biggest organisations in the city, and they have quite a voice, both locally and nationally. And actually, they have the ability to use that voice to influence the debate around what some of these things need to look like going forward. Um, I think about some of the things that have happened in the last few years where various immigration policies, students have find that found themselves subject to, to study bans, there's been various different debates around finance and other things and actually some of the universities within the University of Sanctuary Network have been very key in raising and promoting those issues and, and getting answers to some of those questions and bringing those to, to attention. Um, and actually, it can you can you can turn that question both ways. I can understand why someone would think that, but I can also see why you could use it to to use the voice of the University of Southampton in a really positive way, um, because it actually has a lot of power locally. A lot of people would listen to the university locally, but also a lot of power sort of nationally as part of that network. Yeah, I saw Steve waving a hand to come in on on that point. I thought I would wave at you, David. Um, <laughs> Um, no, I, I mean, I, I agree with what's just been said there. I mean, the university is a very important part of the city, of the society of, 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 of that we live in. Um, and I, I have a visiting position with the Faculty for Climate Change and Energy, because that's one of my key areas um, on the climate emergency. And we work really well together. And I think it can be used as a power for, for a force for good. 
Um, but I do, I do also understand your point about the commercialization aspect to, to use it as a sort of potentially use it as a tick box to then brand it and then to use it for the competing in the marketplace with other universities. But I think from what I see, I think it could be used for good. Thanks to uh, Maria and Steve and Nikki there. We've got Terry also wanting to to make a, a comment on that. Yeah, Terry, go for it. Well, I just think, well, um, I get the points about marketing, but actually if the university saw it as a marketing tool, is that such a bad thing, you know, that you're promoting the fact that the university has scholarships and is supportive of refugees? It's actually a good message to put out there. So you could actually turn that around and, and make that a selling point to persuade the university to go for it. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say, I think that that's a very strong point and it's a strong point for advancing the agenda at the University of Southampton because as I think Ben uh, noted in the, in the comments, nearly all Russell Group universities are now universities of sanctuary. I think there are only three that aren't. Um, and, you know, if Southampton wants to make a lot of itself as a Russell Group University, then, you know, it needs to get on that bandwagon. Now, if the effect of that is uh, to basically turn the university into one which is supportive and uh, providing ring fence scholarships for refugees, I'm perfectly happy for them to have a bit of, you know, publicity from it at the same time, you know. Um, um, just to jump in on that too and say, I was going to say as well on the Russell group, yes, it was that there are only three, somebody commented, three that are not out of the Russell group um, having sanctuary awards. And that's a really important point uh, that this can be a way to drag us up, to drag universities up through positive pressure uh, to be doing this. Um, yeah, um, I had another point, but I can't remember at the moment. So I'll pass back to you, David. Okay, thanks. So, um, We've got a couple of general questions um, now. Um, one is about whether the government's uh, new immigration system has any uh, effects on the city of the University of Sanctuary uh, position, um, uh, and which it shouldn't because immigration is separate to. Um, asylum and refuge, but do people think that there are um, likely to be any knock-on effects? Um, one is about staff support um, in terms of what universities of sanctuaries offer, um, say specifically for disabled students. Is there, you know, additional support for people uh, of, of disability? Um, and then uh, a pertinent question, and these are all to the whole panel. Why is the University of Southampton not willing to establish sanctuary scholarships? Is it simply for the reason of the erroneous figure of 100,000 per student that Maria mentioned earlier? I might ask uh, any of the panel that haven't yet um, chimed in if they want to, uh, to chime in on those questions first and then, um, and then open it to the whole panel. No pressure. <laughs> Could I come in here? Uh, can you? Uh, yes, just, great. Partly just to go back to the last point about, uh, and to amplify Maria in terms of the future generation, one thing that I found teaching uh, refugee history is, is how enthusiastic students are. And I think one thing we can do quite easily is that I think it is refugee issues are taught at very different uh, ways across the university in humanities, social sciences and, and law and elsewhere. And if we made more of that collectivity, it would show to the students that it matters to us uh, and uh, it matters to the students. I think the students uh, relish the chance to engage with that and, and students of refugee origin. Uh, themselves, I think, are empowered by, by doing such courses. Uh, and just on, on that, the second, the, the more recent thing of, of, of why is the university being reluctant? And yes, I think finance uh, is part of it, but it's also been a culture which has not been a particularly inclusive one in recent years. And I, th I think that we are 
in transition, even though they're going to be in a very difficult financial situation, and we need to push hard. It's a um, fr from below with students and, and staff and, and uh, from the outside pushing the university into this. Partly, I think, through em embarrassing it into doing it, but partly because this is the right thing to do and it's good for the university. Do you think, Tony, that staff support would be helpful in that, uh, as in the first question that David asked? Uh, and from the other side of that, Maria, do you think that that would help with student support if students and staff work together? Absolutely. I, I think there is, uh, it's something that there would be very little tension in doing. I think it's something that, that uh, there are a lot of staff that would be very committed to that, and a lot of students, and, and the, the chance to work together would be fantastic. Um, yeah, just um, going on from that, I remember when I first became president of STAR and I kind of got a handover from the previous president who mentioned there used to be, um, I don't know if it would count as a society, but it was a group of um, staff from the University of Southampton who were, um, it was kind of like a STAR, but for staff. Um, and, you know, she said that we could kind of collaborate with them on events and that would also definitely help with campaigning in terms of having um, kind of senior senior management influence. Um, unfortunately, the person that started that um, left the university and then the groups kind of disbanded after that. Um, but I think if we did have that, that would have been, it would have been like amazing um, in terms of getting support for our campaigns. Um, in terms of the events that we run, it would have completely, it would have just amplified it a lot more. So I think it is important to have some sort of collaboration between staff and students and if that's you know having a sort of st staff society set up um, then yeah that would be great. Esther how would you think that um, people seeking sanctuary on scholarships would uh, feel about that or participate uh, within that kind of thing with a kind of student staff network? You're just on mute there, Esther. Sorry, we can't hear. Yeah, I think it's uh, it gives kind of hope. It encourages more people to um, get into the system, and um, it gives more encouragement in, in rather than giving up on a particular dream, and it will help in stabilizing, integrating people into the system. I think. Wonderful, thank you. David, I'll pass on to you, unless anyone from the panel has something to add for a, another round of questions, if that works. Your microphone's just on mute, David, sorry. Right, sorry, I unmute myself. Um, so one question is, uh, I wonder if conversations have already had been had with university management and what the uh, outcome has been. Um, so, um, Tess, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Do you want sure. me to? Sure. Um, I suppose, yeah, I suppose we're probably the best place to do that. Um, I'm sorry to the panel, but jump in at any point. But um, just to say that so far, um, as Steve pointed out, the v new VC is very receptive um, and part of the reticence previously may have been a different management. So we're very uh, happy uh, and positive going forward that this is a great moment to, um, to talk to senior management about this. Uh, and we also have a, um, a CARA working group that we've started, which is a council for at-risk academics, um, which is about providing scholarships for people seeking sanctuary. Um, and we're looking towards how we might be able to do that. So that is some of the the first steps that we've started at the Faculty of Social Science. And this round table as well is a step that we believe is gonna to bring together um, people from around the university um, in support of um, sanctuary and that we hope to do something going forward out of that. So that's just briefly. David, if you'd like to add anything or any of the other panel on that question. Um, not really, I mean, I, th I think that, you know, they're already, um, moves. I mean, Maria mentioned um, uh, my old colleague Derek Leaving, um, who chaired the um, staff um, uh, refugee and asylum support 
group at the university and unfortunately left with the list of members so so uh, there was then something of a problem kind of reconstituting that group um that's kind of started to happen and we're very happy in in social sciences that the dean um jane falkingham um is now um who is also the university's equality and diversity uh officer um is extremely supportive in this area so i mean there should certainly be conversations after this um event uh between some some people at the university um doing that i mean i think something steve said earlier was very important i mean the new vc is also has also been much keener about working with the city um and there have been a number of you know agreements signed between the university and the city recently so we actually have a kind of you know real opportunity you know in these next few years to to, to really build this forward and to make the kind of sanctuary another kind of link between the city and and the university um i i, I think that would be great if we can we can kind of get that that done in the next you know it's going to be a process but if we can get it done in the next two three years that would be really amazing um would anyone like uh steve would you like to add something there uh, yes i would um I, I just wanted we did miss answering one question and david asked about the immigration system uh, obviously being a labor councillor i would sooner not have pretty patel as the home secretary but we have got Pretty Patel as the Home Secretary. And we have had a long period of hostile environment, wind rush, uh, you could go on. Um, so um, I, I think to answer your question, David, as a politician, um, I am not very hopeful about that immigration system, but we will have to see how it pans out. And just, um, just also for what David said there, I think this is a moment in time, there is an opportunity and, and you need to seize the moment because I think there is a, there is a real, got to drive it through and I think there is a there is a desire there and I think you're pushing on an open door great thanks um so if I can just go to another set final set of questions perhaps yeah that sounds perfect thank you David okay um so question is um could universities have special open days for refugees to guide them through the process or in other words some kind of dedicated access um, for refugees to guide them through the process. Um, uh, what real difference can we make to the lives of people arriving and settling in the city and surrounding area? And how will we monitor our plans and take follow up action to ensure change? Um, and then finally, a kind of very topical um, one, uh, thinking of Black Lives Matter, our University of Sanctuary uh, working together with campaigns about, about anti-racism and decolonizing the curriculum. Okay, so let's kind of take those in order because they're all slightly different. So the first question about uh, open days, uh, would any of the panel like to comment on that one and what that might add? Yes, Terry. Yeah, um, I mentioned earlier that we run um, a residential for unaccompanied asylum seeking young people. And as part of that, um, the team is run through the widening participation team. They normally take them on a visit to another university. And these are all young people working towards university. Um, so we've had a visit one year to Bournemouth University and another year to Portsmouth. We haven't yet been to Southampton. So that would be an opportunity as soon as we start face-to-face -face residentials again, hopefully next year. Um, it happens in August. It would be great to bring them to Southampton uh, to experience that. And I think I'm right in saying that we have with us in the audience Trish Nicolaides. Um, Trish yes. uh, is aware of that work and would be a great champion, I think, to work with the Winchester staff who she knows very well to make that suggestion for next year. I'm also aware there are, 
there's at least one or two other universities that do refugee openings, and I can't remember which ones they are, but Ben might remember if he wants to add something in the comments. It's a great idea, a great thing to do. Just to take us to the next question, because I can see we're, we're heading towards um, the end time of the, the panel. Um, so the, the second question was about the city um, and what it can do. Could you repeat that question, David? Yeah, sure. So this question was, um, what real differences can we make to the lives of people arriving and settling in the city and surrounding area? And how will we monitor our plans and take follow up action to ensure change? And particularly, you know, um, what part of the culture of higher education do we need to change to make such a difference? On the first part of that question, I might go to Mike. Um, and then maybe for the second, we can hear a bit more about the university's part of that. But Mike, would you like to talk about the city? Yeah, I think that um, there are lots of things that people can do in Southampton. And uh, as I said earlier, I think it's the responsibility of all of us. Um, the, the three things that I've written down here are um, challenge, um, which is wherever you come across d discrimination that is to the detriment of asylum seekers and refugees, then challenge it, um, bring it up, um, actually make it a topic because that's how discussion starts and that's how opinions get changed. Um, to, to, to witness um, the, 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 um, the experiences of asylum seekers and refugees that you know about um, and what they've been through so that you can share that with, uh, with other people. Um, and volunteer, um, not necessarily for CLEAR, although I'd be very welcome that you'd be very welcome at CLEAR, but there are a number of other organizations in the city that actually have um, the welcoming of asylum seekers and refugees at their heart. And, um, and, and volunteering, I, 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 can't, um, I can't overestimate how important that is that a lot of the work that clear does for instance would be impossible without um, the dedication of all of our volunteers and and what might be just a couple of hours of your time in a week um, is actually making the world of difference to someone who wants to be accepted and absorbed into the city um, as a as a citizen um, and and in a way it's working against the hostile environment. We have to be the antimatter to the hostile environment, which is got to be a, a, a culture of welcome and acceptance uh, of refugees and asylum seekers. I think that leads nicely into the, the last question there, unless anyone wants to jump in on the university aspect, I might move us to the, the last question. Is that okay with the panel? Okay, so the last question there about Black, Black Lives Matter and anti-racism is a big question, um, but an important one. I can see Nicola's, Nicola's chomping to answer yeah. that one. <laughs> I, just, I think on behalf of obviously City of Sanctuary, um, to, to start that off, to say that that's a conversation we are having as City of Sanctuary as an organisation, but also as a network. And within our network, that includes groups like Southampton City of Sanctuary, but also our Universities of Sanctuary stream and all of the other streams of work. Um, and I think one of the things we are looking at doing is working with partner organizations who have the expertise in some of these issues um, but also have already done a lot of work in that area to make sure that we are sort of amplifying their voices and their work and actually bringing some of those conversations into the work that we're doing and that's not going to happen overnight because there is no quick overnight answer to a lot of these questions um, and it is going to take some time to work through but actually we can be as the University of Sanctuary Stream, as City of Sanctuary groups, as our network, we can have those conversations both locally and nationally and, and very much feed into that. We have an operational advisory board ourselves as an organisation made up of people seeking sanctuary who are feeding in their views on what we need to do as an organisation and what our university stream needs to do, what our school stream needs to do and, and where we should be going with this kind of work. And I, I know that, for example, STAR um, and Mariah's group will be having similar conversations nationally and locally as to what that work needs to look like. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, would anyone else on the panel like to uh, talk about the Black Lives Matter connection there in the hostile environment?
it's a big one to throw out at you all. I think that it's, it's really great what you've outlined there, Nicola, that what's already happening. Um, I wonder if we might stop the questions there just because of time. Um, were there any other pressing questions there, David, or is that a good juncture? No, that, that, that's, we pretty much covered uh, Okay. It. Wonderful. I just wanted to add as well, just a little shout out I noticed in the, in the uh, comments, Christine Nielsen's um, just posted about the university opening up to campus, the, the campus, and I could see Matt Ryan's also in the audience, and I wanted to say they're both in the CARA working group. So we have some critical mass in the audience here who are working at the University of San uh, Southampton towards Sanctuary. Um, I'm just gonna hand over to Terry now for some closing remarks. Um, and then I'm going to say a few words to bring the round table to a close, but thank you so much to the panel uh, for all the wonderful presentations then and, and for uh, the q and I wish we could continue this conversation, but this is only the beginning. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to Terry now. Thanks a lot, Terry. Thank you, everyone. And um, this could go on for hours, really. There's just so much to explore and discuss and develop. Um, and I think a really important thing for Southampton to remember is that you're not alone on this. And it's really important for universities to work collectively, to have a voice together, um, but also to support each other um, and learn from each other in how we go about things. So one example of that collective voice was um, just before Christmas last year, um, when I think in the end it was about 20 UK universities signed um, a UNHCR pledge towards the goal of getting 15% of refugees globally into higher education by 2030. Um, it went to every university. I don't think um, Southampton signed that pledge. But when you look at the global estimates, um, it's estimated that 3% of refugees enter higher education, and that compares with a global average of 37% of people. So universities have got a huge role to play in, in gaining momentum and actually making this happen. So universities are sanctuary recognise good practice um, in welcoming uh, asylum seekers and refugees into university communities, fostering that culture of welcome and inclusivity, um, including recognizing the way in which sanctuary students bring new perspectives and cultures and diversity into the institution. That's a really important gain for universities. Um, but also, as Nicola mentioned right at the beginning, uh, the award itself recognises the work that universities do benefiting their local community. And there is already a lot that Southampton are doing. It's just gathering all that information together from the various arms of the university and the Star Society to find out what's already happened and is happening. So um, from my perspective and experience, I would say that the next steps for Southampton are absolutely to start with learning, uh, which is the key point in getting the University of Sanctuary Award. So you need to learn from the refugee community, from the organisations like CLEAR that work with them, and from other universities engaged in the work. Set up some scholarships. Uh, you can do that before you get the University of Sanctuary Award, um, but you must have it before you can get the University of Sanctuary Award. I would say Think carefully about who would be eligible for such a scholarship. It doesn't have to be just those who are seeking asylum. It can also be, and I, in my view, should also be for those that have limited um, leave to remain, because it takes years to get from that point to get indefinite leave. And all that time, there's no access to student finance. Um, then you need to embed that positive action right across the university and create a three-year plan for how to go on developing the work. And you need to share the work across England, the UK, globally. Um, and I would just say that there already are some really helpful mechanisms in place to do that. You're probably aware that there's a GISC mail list um, for Sanctuary. Now that's really helpful. People can put questions out there and get very quick responses. There's also the annual conference, as Nicola mentioned. And locally, um, it would be lovely to have a little working group. Um, South, Southampton, Portsmouth are about halfway through the process of getting their sanctuary award application together. 
Bournemouth University have their first scholarship um, being awarded this year and I happen to know that because it was a, a student who'd also applied to Winchester but who lived in Bournemouth um, and Arts University Bournemouth are interested. I'm not sure where Solent are at the moment but I can see a really good group there that could really support each other at the local level and um, you know that could go on for, for years to come in, in helping each other through and understanding how to deal with different situations that arise. So I would just want to say good luck to you. I really look forward to hearing more about developments and um, please let me know if I can help in any way. Thank you so much for those closing remarks, Terry. I think you've given us um, some real ideas and suggestions and tools there that we can take forward. Um, I'm going to just pro provide a couple of closing thoughts now, but I'm going to be very brief because uh, you've all been um, very lovely to spend this last couple of hours of your Thursday with us, but I'm sure you all want to go and have some dinner or, or chill out. So I'm not going to say too much more now, just to say that this has been such a great starting point um, to generate um, awareness and momentum just through this roundtable itself. Um, and I think it's given us a, a springboard to move forward with some concrete actions um, for the University of Southampton to become a University of Sanctuary. And it's, it, it is about this kind of event about movement generating as well and creating those networks and connections we're talking about um, within the university, but also across the community, uh, which is why we have um, this cross-sector conversation going on. Um, and we're going to be taking on board all of these suggestions and comments from the speakers and the audience today. Uh, we didn't manage to get to all of them. I'm sorry about that, but we're saving the chat and this will all be going into uh, a briefing. Uh, and I'll also be writing a, a blog post about the, the round table. Uh, and the idea of the briefing is um, to bring together what needs to happen going forward, which has come out of this round table. And we've got an eye to um, delivering this to the University of Southampton senior management. And they're aware of the round table uh, and they've indicated that they're interested in receiving um, the results of the discussion. So that's a really positive, productive thing for us to go forward with. Uh, and that briefing will include all of the, the range of things that have been discussed, including scholarships um, for people seeking sanctuary, um, working groups, uh, the benefit um, that people seeking sanctuary bring to the campus and the diversity um, and also um, the culture change that needs, the, the culture shift that needs to happen across the university and the engagement with the community. Um, so um, this just, there was a, qu a question in the chat about if this uh, recording will be shared, that will be going out as well. Um, we'll be, um, getting in touch with everyone via email um, from the mailing list who registered for this roundtable uh, and sending up a follow-up to see if you want to be involved with next steps uh, going forward and being kept informed and you can opt in and out of that. Um, and um, also I just wanted to just quickly say there was an important point in there about decolonization and I think decolonizing the curriculum really relates back to the uh, discussion about um, the current moment that we're in uh, and that's all about that culture shift and that culture change within the university again. Um, so on that note uh, and on a timely note, just hit, about to hit seven o'clock, um, I'd like to thank our speakers again so much. I'd like to thank our audience. I'd like to thank everybody behind the scenes coordinating. Um, done a fantastic job. Thank you for, for um, being part of this round table. Um, and I think we've created a really solid foundation here to begin building sanctuary at the University of Southampton. Um, and I did have a slide to show at the end, which I'm just remembering. And now we have to deal, unfortunately, with my technological incompetence right at the end. Please bear with me. Okay, so slide at the end, I'm getting there. Oh, okay, there we go. So that slide's just to say, um, please continue to uh, support Refugee Week, um, which goes till Sunday. Um, and you can check out all the great events going on online at refugeeweek.org.uk uh, and keep tweeting about this after, after the fact, uh, hashtag Sanctuary Uni Soton. Um, take care to everybody and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks a lot for joining us.